Peter is a Polish-born entomologist, photographer, and author, currently a research associate with the Museum of Comparative Zoology here at Harvard. He focuses his research on the evolution of katydids and related insects and the theory and practice of nature conservation. He received his master's in zoology from the Mikovich University in Poland and a PhD in entomology from the University of Connecticut in Storrs. From 2002 to 2009, Peter served as director of the Invertebrate Diversity Initiative at Conservation International in Washington, D.C. In addition to being a top scientist and conservationist, you will see in his book that he's also a very talented photographer. And I bet we'll see some of that on the screen. He's one of the founding members of the International League of Conservation Photographers. And his photography has been exhibited at the American Museum of Natural History, New York City, the Natural History Museum in London, the Aqua, Aqua Marine Fukushima in Japan, and here at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. Please welcome Peter Nezrecki to the podium. Thank you, David, for this introduction. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Um, what I will be talking uh, about tonight is the topic of relics. Um, that comes from a fascination, uh, a fascination and an obsession that I'm sure I share with uh, many of you in the audience, and that's an obsession with time travel. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I dreamt of being able to go back in time and, and see the worlds and organisms and ecosystems that existed long before a uh, human uh, appeared on, uh, on the surface of, of our planet. And I believe that this fascination had its origin in uh, one small, seemingly insignificant event. One, I grew up in Poland, and, and one time I was, when I was coming back from school, I was maybe eight or nine, I noticed um, on the in a curbside, a, a big rock, a boulder, with a little beautiful shell embedded in it. It was just absolutely perfect. It looked like sort of like a scallop, and I knew I had to have it. So I sneaked out at night, and I dug it out, and I left a big gaping hole in the, in the sidewalk that I'm sure made a lot of people unhappy. And I locked it home, and uh, I showed it to my grandmother and asked her what she thought about it. And she hesitated for only about a second, and then, then she proclaimed that, well, that was, that's a remnant of the Great Flood, and this is a, one of the animals that didn't make it to the ark. Um, and, you know, a, a, a good little Catholic boy that I, that I was, uh, I, of course, accepted her explanation, but at the same time, it struck me as counterintuitive that this aquatic animal would drown in the flood. So I went to my father. Uh, my father was an astronomer, a man of science, to get some extra uh, uh, explanation, and, and together we determined that that shell probably belonged to a brachiopod, uh, an animal uh, superficially similar to mollusk, and based on the appearance of this shell, it might have been uh, from the period called the Cretaceous and about, you know, 60 million years or so. And, and that really blew my mind. I started reading or, or rather browsing uh, books on paleontology, most of which, most of the information went way above my young little head, but it opened up to me this wonderful world of these past uh, uh, f life forms and ecosystems. And, uh, and, but the one thing I couldn't wrap my mind around is the fact that I will never ever see them. And, and then I stumbled upon something very interesting, a, a little bit of news uh, that I found uh, absolutely enthralling. And that was uh, a piece of news about a discovery of a fish of the coast of southern Africa, and a fish called uh, the coelacanth, or Latimeria, and there was a fish that had been considered extinct for at least the last 60 million years, and here it was, living, breathing, fossil animal. So ever since, I've been fascinated with the, with the notion that there might be uh, places and organisms that somehow preserve in their appearance or biology or physiology or genes fragments of these, of these ancient worlds. And this is what this book is about. 
this is not a book about living fossils. There is no such thing. But it is about, about lineages and ecosystems that date way back and for one reason or another have been able to preserve uh, these, these ancient uh, elements in their, in their appearance, biology, um, or, or, or behavior. And so what I would like to do is I would like to take you now on a little trip around the globe uh, and we'll visit a few of those lineages and a few of those places that I find uh, particularly interesting. And we begin our journey on the islands of New Zealand. New Zealand is special. New Zealand has been isolated for the last 80 million years uh, since the time it got separated from the rest of this giant supercontinent, uh, Gondwana. And because of its isolation, it managed to preserve in its biota these little snippets of this ancient world, and none is more emblematic of it than, of course, the Tuatara. Uh, the Tuatara is a reptile like no others. It's the, the last remaining member of the order called Sphenodontia, uh, an order of reptiles that was quite uh, uh, rich in species and widely distributed in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. There were lots of Sphenodontia species, both aquatic and, and terrestrial, but Tuatara is the only one remaining. They are closely related to lizard and snake, uh, or so-called squamates, but they are not the same animal. They share the same ancestor, but they diverge very, very early on. And we know that Tuatara is uh, unique because it preserves in its uh, body uh, these uh, telltale signs of its ancient provenance. When the Tuataras were first uh, discovered, the, the first uh, uh, exemplar, the first skull of the Tuatara was sent from New Zealand to London in 1830. And, um, the person who received the skull didn't quite realize what he had, and he described it as, a, uh, as, a, as another species of an agamid lizard. But when you look at the skull, you will notice that it has elements that are not present in any other reptile today. It has so-called fully uh, developed temporal fenestry of, the, of these windows uh, behind the eye. Uh, all other reptiles, uh, all lizards, and all snakes have lost this, this uh, what's called the juggler bridge here, and they have a, a very, very different skull. This skull and some other elements of the uh, skeleton of the Tuatara tells us that, that this is a very, very ancient uh, animal, at least coming from a very, very ancient uh, lineage. So how did they manage to survive for so long? Now, the Tuatara is not the only reptile that you'll find in New Zealand. There's a number of lizards. There's actually quite a bit of a, a species radiation, both among skinks and geckos. And yet, Tuatara was able to compete with those modern reptiles. Well, there are, there are several reasons for that, uh, for several very likely reasons. One of them is that the Tuatara loves cold weather. It has the lowest optimal uh, temperature of any reptile living today and it actually can feed, mate and essentially live very fulfilling life when the temperature drops to a very low 60s or even the 50s. And no other reptiles living today can function, fully function, in those temperatures. And this is most likely a very recent adaptation but one that allowed the Tuatar to outcompete other reptiles on, on the islands. The second reason why uh, the Tuatara has probably been able to survive is that for some strange reason, New Zealand never had native terrestrial mammals. The only mammals that you'll, native mammals that you'll find on New Zealand is a small handful of bats and these fur seals. And this one is very clearly, te clearly telling me that it's going to bite my leg off if I don't move away a little bit. I was really getting too close to this animal. But anyway, so there was no competition from terrestrial mammals on New Zealand, and that was probably why Tuataras were able to uh, survive. Now that has, of course, changed within the last, let's say, 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, the first humans arrived on New Zealand. These were um, Polynesian uh, people who later became uh, the Maoris, um, the native culture of New Zealand, and they brought with them, as expected, uh, domestic animals, pigs, dogs, and they also, inadvertently, of course, uh, they also brought rats. Now, the New Zealand suffered the second wave of colonization in the 
uh, second half of the 19th century when the British came. And they decided to turn this unique pearl of biodiversity into a South Pacific version of England. And they brought with them pretty much everything that they could, uh, including most mammals, most European mammals, for either their hunting pleasure or for some other bizarre reasons. Um, and they also brought with them 25,000 25, species of non-native plants. And what that caused, first of all, the mammals that they brought caused an absolute devastation uh, within the native uh, fauna of birds and reptiles and amphibians and insects and so on. 42% of native birds in, uh, on New Zealand are extinct. The non-native, invasive, fully established vascular plants outnumber in the terms of species and biomass the native flora. So New Zealand is a, is a catastrophe of unimaginable proportions. And not surprisingly, things that used to be uh, native to the islands, such as Tuatara, are now mostly extinct. There are no free living Tuataras on New, in on, on New Zealand. The only place where you can find native populations of, New uh, of Tuataras are on tiny little outlying islands in the Cook Strait that separates the North and, and the South Islands and in the uh, Bay of Plenty. And uh, this is the only reason why the, this species has been able to survive, because rats were not able to get to those islands and that saved that species. So now, um, Conservationists in New Zealand are really, really trying hard to rebuild this population. There is a, uh, a captive breeding program for this species at the uh, uh, Victoria University in Wellington. Uh, and uh, they have also established a, a small reserve on the ma mainland, on North Island near Wellington, where uh, a wild or semi-wild population of Tuataras is actually successfully uh, breeding right now. So two years ago, the first um, uh, so-called wild tuatars hatched. Oops. First, the wild tuatars hatched uh, on on the mainland on of New Zealand, probably the first time in 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 at least two or three hundred years. But when tuatars were or tuatara relatives, the Sphenodontia, were still common uh, across the globe, they probably lived um, uh, in an environment that was populated by a plant, uh, an ancient, ancient lineage of plants uh, that we can still witness in many places of the world, but we can really see a habitat, a truly Jurassic habitat in one place, in South Africa. And the plants I'm talking about, of course, are the cycads. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the cycads. Cycads uh, are frequently lumped together with palms, uh, palm trees, but a palm tree into a cycad is about as close as a cow is to a Tyrannosaurus rex. Uh, they are, these are ancient, ancient plants. They, they, their roots are firmly planted uh, in the Permian. They are at least 200, the lineage is at least 250 million years old. And yet, they have been able to survive quite successfully. And actually, uh, just about, uh, uh, Six or seven million years ago, uh, cycads uh, underwent another uh, quite spectacular species radiation. So all the species that we see now are relatively young, but the lineage itself and most of the morphology and physiology of the cycads that we still uh, we can we can witness date date way way back. So how did this lineage manage to survive? Again, there are. Many different reasons. So this is, by the way, um, a, a glimpse of the cycad forest, the last remaining cycad forest in the world, which is in a place called Mojaji in the Limpopo province of South Africa. And if you've ever been to South Africa, you've probably never heard of it, but if you ever go there, try and, and, and make a, a trip uh, uh, to, to the Mojaji, uh, Mojaji forest. It's an walking through among these cycads, it's really like a trip back in time. It's absolutely, absolutely spectacular. These are enormous, enormous uh, trees. They are at least 30 uh, feet high, and each of these trees is probably close to 1,000 years old. It's an absolutely incredible place. Um, so how did they manage to do that? How did they survive? Well, the reasons are, again, two or threefold. Well, first of all, the one thing to know about cycads, 
the, if you were to take away one bit of information, they are all deadly. They are extremely, extremely toxic. Uh, the tissues of all cycads are saturated with toxins. These are not just regular toxins. These are so-called genotoxins. These are toxins that will actually alter your DNA, which means that if you ingest those toxins, if you don't drop, drop that immediately, <laughs> they will start spawning all kinds of mutations, so will eventually you will die of cancer. Not only that, they will also alter the DNA in your reproductive cells, so your children will develop cancer from those cycads. <laughs> so it's not surprising that cycads really do not have natural predators. There are no <laughs> big herbivores that eat cycads. There's a very small handful of insects that can actually eat, eat the uh, cycad tissue, but it's really very, very small. The only exception in terms of eating cycads are their cones, and some cones they are. Cycads produce the largest cones in the plant world. A single cone can be three feet long and weigh about 80 pounds. And they look like this. They are spectacular. They're absolutely spectacular. And if you see something that has this color in the plant world, that's usually some kind of advertisement. And of course, this, this, this cone is telling birds and monkeys that it's OK to eat me. So this part of this, this is the only part of the cycad that's not absolutely saturated with toxins. And that's why birds, will, such as hornbills you often see in South Africa, hornbills feeding on cycad cones, and they can easily digest this soft, uh, uh, brightly colored tissue. But of course, the seed that's contained in it is very, very toxic. So it passes undigested through the, uh, through the digestive tract of the bird, and, and then it uh, sprouts. Um, so toxicity is probably one of the main reasons why cycads have been so successful. The other reason is that cycads are very good at forming uh, meaningful relationships. And, and one of the relationships that they formed was with a group of small organisms known as cyanobacteria. Uh, cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, are uh, one of the few, or if not the only organism in the world that is capable of um, sequestering or, or uh, getting its nitrogen directly from the atmospheric uh, air. Uh, we all need nitrogen to live. Um, animals, such as humans, get their nitrogen from the food we eat. Uh, plants get it in a, some kind of a soluble fo format from the soil, from, uh, from the, uh, all kinds of salts that contain uh, nitrogen. But cyanobacteria can get it directly from the air. And cycads have, made, have created a, a symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria. They have actually special roots. They are called coralloid uh, roots that contain cyanobacteria. And those cyanobacteria provide nitrogen to the cycads. What it means is that cycads can grow absolutely anywhere. They can grow on virtually sterile rocks, like these karsts here. Karsts are, are rocks that contain almost no nutrients. That is, there's no soil there. Uh, so, and yet, uh, um, cycad can attach themselves to these rocks and survive quite well because they get their uh, oxygen and um, uh, carbon from the air and, and their nitrogen from their uh, cyanobacterial uh, symbionts. So that's, that, and that's probably why they've survived. Now, so South Africa. But cycads are not the only botanical wonders, ancient botanical wonders that you will see in South Africa. The western part of South Africa, the almost the entire west coast, is a place of incredible botanical richness. Uh, it's the, it, this place is so rich in uh, species, unique species of plants, that it has been designated as a, as a floral kingdom. The entire world is divided in only six such kingdoms. For example, most of North America, Europe, uh, Northern Asia, and Africa north of, of the Sahara all put together uh, create another floral kingdom, kingdom called Holarctis. And the Cape Floral Kingdom is only the size of the state of Maine, and it contains an equivalent number of unique families and species of plants. There are about 9,000 unique uh, uh, species of plants in South Africa. And uh, the, the reason why we have it is, is uh, to understand that we have to go a little bit, a little bit back in time. 
Uh, about 10 million years ago, Southern Africa and South Africa were very tropical. Uh, the entire continent was, was covered with uh, uh, essentially a rainforest or a very tropical uh, types of vegetation. But then, in Miocene, about six or seven million years ago, uh, the ice of the Antarctica started melting and that resulted in the creation of a very, very cold oceanic cu current called Benguela that still flows around the, uh, the western coast of, of Africa. What, that, what it did to the climate of Africa, it, the climate become, became in parts much drier but also much, much colder and m far more seasonal. And those tropical plants that used to grow there couldn't cope with it and they were very quickly replaced with this type of vegetation. The vegetation that's essentially um, a heath. So all these plants that you find in South Africa are mostly heathers and relatives of heathers. And their the, the diversity is absolutely through the roof. Uh, just to give you an example, there are six species of heathers in North America, species of the genus Erica, six species. Uh, in South Africa, there are 658. Um, so, and, and, and not only there are these huge numbers of species, there's also an enormous what's called floristic uh, species turnover. You can take three steps and you will find a very, very different uh, botanical community. So not surprisingly, if you have such incredible species richness in the plant communities, that will be reflected in the insect communities. And this is wh what I work on. I work on uh, insects that sing, katydids, crickets, uh, grasshoppers. And what I discovered with my colleagues is that these, these dense bushes of, of heathers in South Africa uh, are home to an incredible diversity of grasshoppers and katydids, most of which are still undescribed and unnamed by science. So we found that almost every species of these heathers will have its own little grasshopper and that some of them are incredibly cryptic, uh, very well adapted to living in this, in this dense vegetation. Uh, most of them are surprisingly wingless. And that's one, also one of the reasons why they have remained undescribed for so long. When people, when other entomologists saw something like that, they assumed it was a nymph or larva or something else and just kind of dismissed it. But it turns out that there's this incredible radiation of these tiny wingless insects associated with these thick heather bushes. And again, it makes sense biologically. I mean, if, if you live in a very small patch of vegetation, very dense, surrounded by similar patches, there's really no need to fly because you are surrounded by, uh, by your own kind. And, uh, but these tiny cryptic looking uh, grasshoppers are not the only kind that you'll find in South Africa. You will also f uh, see uh, the opposite uh, end of the spectrum, you will find gigantic, brightly colored species. And that's again related to the botanical diversity of this, of this region. Um, many species that grow in, the, uh, in this uh, South African vegetation, which by the way is called finebus, um, finebus meaning uh, fine or small bush in Afrikaans, uh, many of these species are highly toxic. There's, those plants contain secondary compounds and some of these grasshoppers were able to sequester those uh, compounds, ad, ad, sort of eat them and adopt them for their own defense. And they advertise this, this fact with this, with, first of all, with their size and their very bright coloration. Uh, so beautiful and, and colorful are, th are these insects that, unfortunately, uh, kids uh, in, in uh, Africa will sometimes eat them. Uh, and promptly die uh, because one of the main compounds that these, uh, that these uh, grasshoppers carry are what's called cardiac glycosides. These are uh, alkaloids that will actually stop your heart. Uh, and by what it also tells me that we humans have somehow lost the ability to read the language of nature. Uh, and no, no sane animal would eat anything that looks like this. This is a warning color. If you see you know, bright yellow and black, that tells, that tells you don't eat me, and yet we somehow uh, manage to forget that, 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 that language. Now, let's stay for a second uh, uh, in, in Africa, in South Africa, but let's move a little bit further north and, and where the vegetation changes into an ecosystem not known as uh, succulent karoo. Again, very, very high endemism, but far less water. Uh, it's, you still get seasonal rains with, with some regularity, but there, there's a v much, much less of it. So plants adapted to this type of environment by developing this, this kind of storage system, their, their leaves or their 
of their stems, uh, turning this into these cisterns of water that allow them to uh, survive these uh, prolonged periods of drought. Um, succulent karoo is also a very rocky terrain. Uh, this is actually, this is, uh, this is what succulent karoo looks like just after the spring rains. Because the rains come every year with quite regularly, uh, usually in September, which is the southern spring, but they only last for about a, a day or two, and it's very little of it, and then everything suddenly explodes and starts blooming. And of course, a lot of interesting animals uh, start coming out. But the, the one thing that I want to point out here is that notice how many rocks there are. This is very, very typical of the succulent karoo uh, biome of South Africa. You have all these incredible rocks. And of course, uh, you have then animals associated with those rocks. And there are two, if you live among rocks, you have two uh, possible strategies of avoiding being detected by predators. One is to look like a rock. And there's a whole lineage of insects. This, this, uh, this is a lineage of enormous grasshoppers. These are grasshoppers almost the size of your fist um, that really look like rocks. They spend the entire day motionlessly, and they only become active at the very end of the day when they start kind of moving slowly and, and, and chewing uh, uh, vegetation. The second strategy, if you live along, uh, on rocks, is to sort of live like, uh, like there's no tomorrow. And if something uh, sees you, you just make a ma mad dash to the nearest uh, crevice, and you wedge yourself in, and then you inflate your body and, and uh, stay there. There's, this is a, a, a member of an African family of lizards called uh, Platysauridae, and, and they, they employ this strategy. They will wedge themselves between two rocks, puff up with air, and they are absolutely impossible uh, to pull out by, uh, by a predator. Now, this ability to kind of puff up uh, and become bigger uh, than you really are seems to be a very common strategy uh, among the southern African animals. Um, this little piglet is a, is a frog. Um, it's a uh, shovel-snouted frog uh, um, called Hemesis marmoratus, and uh, uh, normally it looks just like any other frog. It's kind of flat and not particularly conspicuous looking, but if it feels uh, threatened in any way, it immediately starts gulping air and turns into something like that, which, as you can imagine, is not the, most, uh, the easiest thing to swallow uh, if you're a snake or, or some other uh, small predator. Uh, other animals employ similar strategies, uh, even chameleons. Uh, you know chameleons as these animals that, whose main line of defense is to blend in with the, uh, with the background and become uh, inconspicuous. You know that they can change co skin color because of the chromatophores that they have in their skin. But sometimes they have to cross the road or do something that makes them uh, feel exposed. And this is what they will often do. Again, they will puff up start gaping their mouth and look uh, very, very scary. Of course, they're completely harmless. And then there's another group of kind of chunky looking animals that to me is the most fascinating African animal. And I'm talking about bladder grasshoppers. Uh, these are absolutely fascinating animals. These are big, big grasshoppers. Again, you know, this big. Um, and this is actually one of the oldest lineages of, of, uh, of grasshoppers. They probably go back to the Triassic. Um, some, these are some of the earliest uh, uh, grasshoppers that we know from the fossil record. And uh, uh, this enormous body of this grasshopper is filled with air um, permanently. So they cannot deflate. They are always kind of puffed up like this. And why do they do that? Well, as you can imagine, uh, as you probably know, grasshoppers can sink. So they use this incredible inflated abdomen as a resonator to amplify their song. And they produce this song, I don't know if you can see it, but it's like a little ridge here of little teeth. And so they rub their hind legs and in those teeth. And the sound that they are capable of producing using the combination of this balloon and these ridges can be heard from a mile and a half away. You can scream as loud as you want, and you probably will not be heard from a mile and a half away. But these insects, these individual insects, can be heard from such a distance. It's an unbelievably loud sound. You ha it has to be heard to believe. Unfortunately, I don't have a recording. I should have brought a recording. But anyway, absolutely fasc fa fa fascinating uh, group of organisms that also have incredible biology. But interestingly enough, because this is such an ancient, ancient lineage, this is one of the first grasshoppers that ever appeared, 
they don't even have fully developed ears. And perhaps that's why they have to be so loud. <laughs> they don't have tympanal <laughs> organs. Uh, they, they perceive sound with single individual um, neurons that are attached. Uh, there's a pair of neurons attached to each abdominal segment. So they actually have 12 neurons all along their body. Each of, its, uh, each of these neurons is, sen is sensitive to the uh, sound vibration. That's how they perceive sound. But they don't, ha he, uh, they don't have ears uh, to speak of like other grasshoppers and katydids, which have very, very sophisticated hearing organs. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's, let's stay on the African continent because I would like to show you a very different place. Rather than focusing on one organism now, I want to show you uh, an entire ecosystem that is sort of a relic of the, uh, of the past. And we are now in the country of Ghana, which is in West Africa. West Africa, about, again, about 10 million years ago, was completely covered with forests. Uh, lowland rain, rainfall, lowland and middle elevation rainforest, and now we have very little of it left. Um, there's a little bit of it in uh, Liberia, a little bit of in, in Cote d'Ivoire, and also in the country of Ghana. There's a small patch of what's called the Upper Guinean Forest left in a place um, called uh, the Atewa Forest. It's a very, very special place. Atewa Forest is a small fragment of excuse me, a forest uh, located on top of a, a plateau. This plateau is only about eight, eight miles long, maybe three miles wide, uh, and it's about 2,500 uh, feet high. But on top of that plateau, we have a fragment of forest that we know uh, through a very good paleontological record that has, literally has not changed in the last 10 million years. It has always been there. And by virtue of always being there, it has acted as a sanctuary of forest biodiversity, even when the forests around it have disappeared or reappeared. Uh, and so following uh, period, extended periods of drought, uh, this Atewa forest was able to sort of reseed uh, this biodiversity so, uh, so the forest could regrow in, in other areas in West Africa. So it's a very, very important forest. It's a, it's a sanctuary of sylvan biodiversity. And the reason I know about this place uh, uh, is because I have done some work there with uh, my friends who were uh, conservation biologists. We have done um, uh, some survey work and conservation work. And uh, uh, when we, uh, when we fa first went there, we were absolutely astounded by how humid this place is. You don't, you don't expect this type of humidity in West Africa, which is generally fairly dry. Uh, but this place uh, you know, has a humidity that's very similar to what you'll find in lowland rainforests in, in South America or Central America. And that's why you have a very rich uh, fa uh, flora of epiphytes. Everything is just loaded with orchids and, and, and lichens and mosses and so on. And of course, this type of habitat is of course home to an incredible uh, diversity of, of animal life. This is what, of, what the, this, the, the interior of the forest sort of looks like. It's a very, very dense forest. Um, uh, you, you also, of course, have these enormous uh, uh, emergent trees with the tr tree trunks the size of a bus, but, but a lot of it is, is very, very dense, kind of completely permeated with this network of lianas. Um, and what we found there was uh, a diversity of animals in almost any group that completely exceeded our expectations. We found there the highest diversity of butterflies anywhere on the African continent. Uh, this is just a sampling of, of, of some caterpillars that we uh, collected there, none of which uh, we were able to identify the species yet. Uh, they may not be new to science, but this just shows you how little we know about the biology and, and developmental biology of a lot of these insects. Um, uh, we found incredible diversity of ants, and um, I, I'm, I want to point out this one particular ant, not because it's particularly rare or new. This is, this is not a new species. It's a, a known species of a, a genus Chromatogaster that also occurs in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, but there's something very interesting about the behavior of this ant. Uh, the, what you can see here, they are sitting on these red balls, which are actually insects. Uh, these are what's called scale insects. They are relatives of uh, aphids and cicadas, and uh, these insects 
uh, completely sedentary and they feed on plant juices. Plant juices, of course, are rich in water and sugar, uh, but not much else. So they excrete the excess of sugar in the form of what's, of what's called honeydew. And you can see here this little droplet that this ant is um, drinking in here. Uh, so the ants uh, collect the honeydew of the scale insects and provide protections from predation. Common behavior. You will see it in your own garden. If you, if you go out in the summer, find a, uh, a bunch of aphids, watch them for a while, sooner or later, or later, ants will come and display this behavior. What's more interesting is that later I found out that these ants were leaf cutters. Now, leaf cutting behavior up to this point has only been known from the New World, from South and Central America. And here they are in Africa ants cutting leaves. These are ants that are not related to the, uh, the, the leaf cutter ants of South America, and, but they uh, exhibit a very, very similar behavior. Now, we don't know what they do with this uh, fresh plant tissue. Uh, in, uh, in the neotropics, ants use the, um, uh, the plant tissue to grow fungi on which they feed. Here, it's possible that the ants use it uh, merely to build their nests. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but it is the first uh, case of leaf cutting behavior in, uh, in the old world, and it also shows you how little we know about the behavior of uh, most invertebrates in the tropics. Now, uh, the group that I work on, primarily acadidids, and I found in the Atewa forest, again, the highest diversity of acadidids anywhere in Africa. I found a, 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 a acadid diversity comparable to the one you will find in the Amazon, which is unheard of of the African continent, including this animal. This is a bark cadid. I don't know if you can even see it. This is, these are the eyes. This is kind of face-on uh, face shot. Um, uh, this is an animal that lives on, on tree trunks and blends absolutely perfectly. And a lot of these cadidids in, uh, uh, in these uh, African uh, forests are absolutely perfect mimics of, 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 of plants. This is one strategy. Uh, this is another strategy. Uh, this is a type of behavior you will not see in the, in the new world. These, uh, these cadets will flatten their body against the leaf and they will sit upside down on the leaf uh, so that the light, uh, during the day, the light kind of shines through their bodies and they almost completely disappear. Uh, what we also found in Atewa is a very uh, high diversity of amphibians. Uh, in fact, we found there, in this small area, again, eight miles long, we found about 50 species of frogs, uh, some of which uh, we know um, are extinct everywhere else. Uh, so we found some critically endangered species known only from this one last population. Um, uh, even though we didn't sample this particular group, uh, we did find the world's largest scorpions there. Um, this is a, a, what's called the emperor scorpion, uh, a pandinus imperator. Uh, again, this is a species whose range is shrinking and it's becoming rarer and rarer, but we found a very healthy population. The, the reason I'm showing it to you is because um, I want to show you a certain thing about scorpions. As you probably know, uh, scorpions, when exposed to ultraviolet light, they will start glowing blue. Uh, it's a very interesting behavior. Um, and. Uh, we still don't know exactly why they do it. Uh, the prevailing theory is that uh, this coating of, uh, uh, with, uh, with the substance that's called the fluorescent beta carboline helps uh, scorpions reflect the ultraviolet light and thus reduce the amount of ultraviolet radiation getting to their tissues, which is uh, a good thing. Uh, there's also a, a, a recent study that seemed to indicate that uh, this ultraviolet reflecting coating helps uh, uh, the scorpions to decide whether it's day or night. I'm, I don't quite buy it, but anyway. Uh, the point is that they are c coated with this UV reflecting substance and we will see it again in a little while in a very different animal. Um, uh, in terms of mam mammalian population, uh, we found an incredible diversity of mammals including six species of primates, including chimpanzees. Uh, we found incredible diversity of, of bats, uh, including some new species of bats and some new species of of shrews. Uh, we also found there the largest snails, land snails in the world. Uh, genus Akatina has had several species in, uh, in Atewa, but unfortunately, unfortunately they are getting rarer and rarer. And the reason is that they are very tasty. Uh, so people treat this Atewa forest as a sort of like a kind of a walk-in kitchen. Uh, and uh, not only do they harvest, harvest those uh, 
increasingly rare snails. Uh, illegal uh, bushmeat hunting is, is really rampant. Uh, and that has already severely affected uh, a number of populations of large birds and mammals. For example, we know uh, that um, uh, giant parrots used to be very common there. Now they are extinct in Atewa. Several species of antelopes, forest antelopes, are now extinct in Atewa. Um, that's exacerbated by illegal logging. Uh, and illegal logging kind of comes in waves into Atewa. Uh, and uh, at, at certain point in 2002, the Ghanaian government actually had to send the army uh, to Atewa to stop illegal loggers uh, from actually taking the whole forest apart. Uh, but by far, the largest threat to Atewa is mining. So as I mentioned, Atewa is situated on top of a plateau. The problem with that is that plateau is made entirely out of bauxite. So mining corporations, mining uh, companies have been drooling over the rights to mine this, uh, these deposits for years. And um, we were able to, uh, our con conservation group, uh, have been able to convince the, uh, the local authorities to withdraw their permission to, to mine this, uh, these resources. I mean, this is a really, really small part of uh, a, a small chunk of the forest, and even a small-scale mining operation would, would have completely destroyed it. But unfortunately, uh, now a new mining company, uh, a Chinese mining company, is again uh, trying to get into Atewa and essentially strip this inconvenient greenery of the top and get to the, to the bauxite ore. Um, so uh, my colleagues and I, were trying to turn this forest, which has now the designation of the, of the forest reserve, into a proper national park and give it a permanent protection. And so we've been trying to, uh, we, we are all constantly talking to the government of Ghana and local governments and, and trying to convince them that we will be able to give them uh, or help them develop alternative sources of income, uh, such as ecotourism and, 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 and so on. Um, but it's very difficult. Uh, we've been trying to, uh, all kinds of, of PR stunts, like naming new discovered species after, after displays and making a big deal out of it. So this is, by the way, uh, the largest, the world's largest uh, dino spider, or recent lead. This is, again, a very, very ancient lineage of organisms that uh, goes back to the Carboniferous and hardly changed. And we found the largest species in Atewa. It's 11 millimeters long. Um, but it is a fascinating animal. And we're using this, these types of discoveries to kind of strengthen the message of the uniqueness of this place and the need for its protection. Because this place really needs to be protected. Because if Atewa disappears, that means that a thousand years from now, there will never, ever be a chance for the forest to regrow uh, in West Africa. Anyway, uh, I don't want you to leave with, uh, with the thought and idea that you have to go to all these uh, tropical and, and remote places to see uh, these incredible ancient lineages and places. Actually, some of the most fascinating relics you can find right here at home. And some of my favorite ones are in Massachusetts. Um, I don't know if you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know the town of Concord, uh, but I don't know if you're familiar with the place called Esterbrook Woods, which is... Uh, a small patch of, of woodland uh, very close to Concord. And the reason I uh, know about this place is because um, a friend of mine told me that you can bring your dogs there and they can run. And so uh, we've been bringing our dogs to Esterbrook uh, Woods for, for years. Um, but I never thought much about this place as a, as a place uh, f you know, full of interesting biodiversity. The Esterbrook Woods, it's not old. It's the, the woods itself uh, is maybe 150 years old. Uh, that used to be old pastures. And as you walk in Esterbrook Woods, uh, you see these. How many people have been to Esterbrook Woods? Oh, quite a few. So you know that when you walk there, you see these, uh, these rock walls. And these are the ancient, you know, ancient, uh, old demarcation lines for, uh, uh, for pastures and, 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 and meadows. And the woods it's, uh, themselves are not very, very old. But it, then it occurred to me that if I just kind of change my perspective, and look at the Esterbrook Woods the way my dogs see it. I may see something else. So I followed um, um, this little fellow named Max, who is very, very inquisitive. And he always has his snout uh, right to the ground. And when I started looking at these forests from his perspective, this whole new universe kind of opened up. 
And the first thing I noticed uh, were these plants. They are called uh, lycophytes. And lycophytes are the oldest and the first vascular plants that appeared on the surface of the planet. They are not the first plants that grew on land, but they were the first ones that colonized uh, uh, the land and developed a vascular system. So they are very, very old. Uh, and there are several species of these lycophytes in uh, Esterbrook Woods. This is a uh, dendrolycopodium. Um, uh, and this is, uh, oh, I forgot the, uh, the species right now. But there, there are, there are um, the Diphosiastrium, uh, that's another, another genus. And there are se several others. And they are very, very interesting. They, they still have this kind of an ancient uh, reproductive cycle. They don't produce flowers. They don't produce seeds. They reproduce through spores. And another lineage of uh, ancient plants can be seen in uh, Esterbrook Woods. And those are the horsetail ferns. Again, very, very old lineage. If you go there very early in the spring, you'll see this. You will have to sit there for a long time to actually see this. <laughs> but you will see those very, very young plants that develop. They still don't have the chlorophyll in their plant, in their tissue. But this is the reproductive phase of the horsetail fern. And they reproduce through these spores. These spores fall to the ground, and then they develop um, and actually a reproductive plant that's uh, um, diploid that produces gametes then actually produce uh, uh, another uh, green plant that has chlorophyll and, and so on. Uh, by the way, the, the horsetail ferns do not have leaves. So when you see a horsetail, it has these kind of spiky things around the stem. Um, these are just another uh, branches. And those black rings that you'll see sometimes around the stem, these are the actual leaves. Now, the interesting thing about the, the, uh, both of these, of these plants, the, the lycophytes and, and the horsetails, is that these two groups of plants plus the ferns essentially made our civilization what it is now. These plants have propelled the industrial evolution, not these very plants, but their ancestors from the Carboniferous. Because their bodies um, deposited in the ground created these enormous deposits of coal, which propelled the industrial evolution and our technological advancements. So it's thanks to those plants that we can sit here now and, and watch this interesting slideshow. Um, now, but another interesting uh, organisms that I found in Esterbrook Woods that to me is just absolutely mind-blowing uh, is, of course, the magnolia trees. Uh, now, I'm told that the magnolia trees um, that grow in uh, Esterbrook Woods are not native, uh, that this, this is a sort of uh, escaped population. But nonetheless, this, this, the very same species of magnolia, which is called magnolia tripetala, uh, is native uh, uh, to Massachusetts, and it actually Massachusetts uh, forms the northernmost uh, distribution range for this uh, for, for magnolias. Now, the reason why it's interesting is because for the longest time, botanists thought that magnolias hold the key to our understanding of the evolution of the pollination syndrome syndrome, and actually the origin of flowering plants. Um, I don't know if how many of you have read uh, Charles Darwin on. Uh, uh, writings, but one of the things that perplexed him uh, until the very end of his life was the origin of flowering plants because they suddenly appeared. They first appear in the uh, uh, Cretaceous deposits as just individual, some individual plant, and 10 million, years ago, 10, 10 million years later, they are all over and they are the dominant uh, uh, plant, uh, uh, plant form on, on, on Earth. So they just kind of exploded everywhere. And he couldn't understand how did it ha happen. And uh, now we know that this explosion of uh, 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 flowering plant had to do with the coevolutionary process between plants and insects. And magnolias are some of the earliest examples of the development of this pollination uh, relationship between plants and insects. Uh, if you look at the uh, morphology of the magnolia plant, it's still very, very simple. Uh, it, it has a sort of a spiral arrangement, which, which you'll see in these, in these early plants. But most importantly, when you start looking at who pollinates magnolias, you will very quickly discover that it's beetles. And the reason it's beetles is because when magnolias first appeared, there were no other pollinators. There were no butterflies, no bees, uh, very, very few fl flies. So the magnolias had to do with what, what was available, and what was available was beetles. Now, beetles are very unsophisticated pollinators. They're actually called 
uh, mess and soil pollinators because they just get into flowers, start tumbling around and get covered with pollen, then they leave, uh, go into the, another flower, chew up a hole and damage things, but eventually they pollinate something. <laughs> From that, uh, other, uh, other types of pollination have developed much, much more sophisticated, and many other groups of insects have developed relationships of, uh, uh, with, with plants. But this is one of the very, very early chapters, and we can still see it uh, almost as if it was 136 million years ago in Esterbrook Woods. Now, another very interesting thing about Esterbrook Woods, if you go there very early in the spring, you will notice, uh, first of all, you will hear these things. I don't know if you can see it. There's a frog there. That's the wood frog. And you will hear them calling in uh, sometimes as early as late uh, February. But in March, you can hear them all over the place. And they are calling from these small uh, bodies of water called the vernal pools. These are, these are bodies of water that are created by melting snows, uh, snow, and they accumulate in, in little uh, 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 holes in the, in the ground. And that place, the, the vernal pools of Esterbrook Woods, um, a home to one of the oldest uh, surviving lineages of animals. And I'm talking about these animals. They are called fairy shrimp. Uh, this is a photo I took in one of these vernal pools. And when I saw that, I, I was just absolutely astonished. To me, this is as beautiful and as rich as a coral reef. And you find this in a body of water that's only about a, a foot deep uh, in the middle of, you know, of the forest. Now, uh, uh, fairy shrimp belong to a group uh, of crustaceans called branchiopods, and we have fossil records of very similar branchiopods um, dating back to Precambrian. So they are at least half a billion years old, and they have hardly changed. And again, you have to ask yourself, how did they manage to do that? And again, the answer is it's probably related to their um, very uh, sophisticated and multifaceted uh, survival strategy. First of all, they have a fantastic uh, backup plan for surviving uh, life uh, in this very unpredictable and ephemeral environment, such as the vernal pools. Uh, they, they develop very, very quickly. In about two weeks, they, can, they hatch from eggs, achieve adulthood, and reproduce. But the key is their eggs. Their eggs can survive essentially anything. They can be frozen into liquid nitrogen. They can be put in boiling water and they will still hatch. They can sit in this dormancy for many, many, many years, dozen years or more. They can be distributed by wind, so they can colonize almost any habitat. Um, and one time I was in uh, Namibia, which is one of the, if not the driest uh, country in the world, and I was lucky enough to witness one of the very, very rare rains in the Nami Desert. And so the little indentations in the rocks are filled with, with, uh, with water. The next day, those indentations were full with uh, fairy shrimp. Uh, I had no idea that there were eggs there. That those eggs were probably brought in by wind from Kenya or somewhere else. Uh, and they you know, took that opportunity, hatched reproduced and then they disappeared and a week later there was nothing left but I'm sure that the, the entire rock was covered with eggs that will probably wait another 20 years to hatch so it's not surprising that NASA uh, uses um, fairy shrimp and their relatives as a model organisms to study the survival of li life in outer space and that's probably one of the reasons why they have been able to survive for so long but um, I mean, these are, these are really fascinating organisms. This is a, 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 an adult male. Uh, they are very sexually dimorphic. This is a male holding the female with his, uh, he has a kind of pair of big pincers, which are actually modified antennae. And the female develops these big egg sac uh, with eggs. And uh, so these animals are fully adult, and they're only about two weeks old, and they will probably de die the next day. But these eggs can survive for years. Now, but um, the last organisms I would like to mention uh, to you is my absolutely most favorite uh, relic there is. And I'm talking, of course, about horseshoe crabs. Uh, horseshoe crabs have been around uh, since the Ordovician, about 450 million years, and they have hardly changed. In fact, if one crawled right in front of me, one of the old ones crawled right in front of me on the beach of the Delaware Bay, uh, uh, Bay I probably wouldn't uh, even notice anything uh, unusual about it they have hardly changed. Uh, their morphology, that is. Uh, we know that their behavior and physiology have changed quite significantly 
uh, over the last uh, 150 million year, years or so. For example, we know that uh, most of the uh, uh, Jurassic and uh, Cretaceous, um, or actually Jurassic uh, and Triassic uh, horseshoe crabs were probably freshwater. Uh, right now, we have four species of surviving horseshoe crabs. Only one of them uh, is a uh, semi-freshwater one. Um, uh, and there, there were even uh, some land uh, uh, terrestrial uh, horseshoe crabs. One of the species uh, also was most likely arboreal. So it was a very different, uh, uh, very different uh, type of lifestyle, but nonetheless, their morphology has uh, remained essentially unchanged. Um, now, remember that, that scorpion that I showed you? Now, these are horseshoe crabs exposed to ultraviolet light, and they look very much like those uh, scorpions. And what it tells you, one of the things that it tells you, is that they are actually related to scorpions. Horseshoe crabs are not crustaceans. They're chalicerates. They are related to arachnids, scorpions and spiders and so on. But what it also tells you is that these are animals uh, whose main uh, uh, sort of a principal uh, sense is that of vision. Uh, they, you know, as you know, they come out in these huge numbers uh, in um, uh, early summer, late spring, and, every, and early s summer to lay eggs on the beaches of uh, the east coast of North America, and that's how they find each other. They find each other by looking for these uh, glowing uh, bodies in these mur murky uh, waters of, of Delaware Bay. And, but it's also interesting because it can tell you a lot about what happened to that particular individual. As you can see, this guy here, somebody really wanted to eat him. Uh, I mean, somebody has been kind of scratching at him. Adult horseshoe crabs have almost no natural enemies. There are only two things that can potentially eat a horseshoe crab. Uh, it's a big shark and a really, really big turtle. So what I suspect happened here is that, the, that a turtle that wasn't big enough was trying to eat that horseshoe crab. Other than that, adults really have no enemies, um, with one exception, which I'll show you in a second. Now, so horseshoe crabs come in these huge numbers uh, every, every year to lay their eggs on the, on the shores of Delaware Bay. Uh, this type of behavior, when, when, the, uh, when the eggs are laid in a very, very different environment uh, from that where the adults live, is called the ex export strategy of reproduction. So they export their eggs to an, a different environment, they hatch there, and then they return to the sea. And the reasons for that is probably uh, because of the number of predators, potential predators in the sea that would be interested in eating those, those eggs. And those eggs are very, very nutritious. Uh, uh, this is just a, a view of the beach after the, the, the night of spawning. And it looks like if, if a battle had taken place there, there are like these tracks, like you know, thousands of small tanks went through it. But what you will find there the next morning is millions and millions and millions of these nutritious eggs. Uh, two weeks later, they, they are all in the sand. Two weeks later, these little larvae will hatch. And they're called trilobite larvae. They really look like tiny little trilobites, to which, by the way, horseshoe crabs are, are quite closely re related. And then they enter the ocean and, and start swimming. Now, of a clutch of about 100,000 or so eggs, maybe one will actually reach adulthood. So it's a very kind of a, a, a low investment in, in individual uh, egg type of reproduction. So this is the main enemy now for, of the horseshoe crabs. Uh, when they come out on shore, they often get stranded, and they often get stranded on, on their backs when their soft parts are, are fully exposed. And seagulls and, and raccoons and other animals will attack them, and they will actually will try to rip out uh, body parts. Now, but surprisingly, many of these horseshoe crabs will survive these horrific injuries. And they will survive it because they have this fantastic line of defense. Now, notice this, this blue goo. Uh, that's their blood. Uh, their blood is copper-based as opposed to iron-based, so it's not red but blue. And they, they don't really have an immune system like we do, but they have an equivalent of an immune system. They have a certain type of cells called um, uh, amoebocytes that are very, very sensitive to contamination with bacteria. And the moment amoebocytes detect any kind of a contamination, they will instantly form this massive, massive clot that will prevent uh, these uh, antigens from uh, entering the body of the, of the crab and, and developing an infection. So people realize that that can actually have a very, very good application for us. So um, there's a now an, an entire industry uh, developed around harvesting horseshoe uh, crab blood and turning it into a compound 
known as Alimulus uh, amoeboside lysate, lysate, which is now a standard compound to detect bacterial contamination in surgical instruments and or in, uh, on, in your body fluids. And I can tell you that if you ever had a, 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 any kind of a surgery or, or given any kind of an in injection, your life was probably saved or at least helped uh, to be saved by horseshoe crabs. So, you know, be mindful of that. So next time you walk on the beach and you see a, a horseshoe crab flailing its little arms and trying to turn over to help it, because uh, <laughs> he already helped you. So wh what I would like to, you know, this, this, is some, this is what I would like to end with. Uh, I urge you to explore the world around you. It's just absolutely full of these fantastic ancient, ancient organisms. And uh, if you have a chance, go to Delaware, on the, on the new moon or full moon in May and, 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 and June, and you may witness a fragment of the world as it probably appeared about 150 million years ago. Thank you very much.